And then, you know, just talk a little bit about, I mean, people have heard about what TU Bruiser was doing over in Ramadi. And we'll get to how we interacted, but overall, what were you guys doing when you first got there? You just kind of jumped into it with yeah. both feet, as they say. <laughs> we did, man. Um, so I'd get there. I've got a SALT team that stands for Supporting Arms Liaison Team. Really what it meant was three of those little four-man teams uh, grouped together in a one 13-man team because we had an additional corpsman, a little uh, medic with us. So I had three of those teams that I was responsible for. And, and I kind of knew what I expected was going to happen when I got there, that I would be in what's called the, the TOC, the Tactical Operations Center, which was I'd kind of run things from the desk and farm out my teams and units to support the guys that needed our help. These army units that were gonna go do missions, they needed someone to help them control the air. I had those teams, I would give them those teams. Well, it took basically no time to get there and realize that the demand signal for our support was higher than we could have ever responded to. They needed 20 of our teams, right. not three. And so that idea that I would kind of be a COC guy, a top guy, was over in the first day because as I get there and we're doing the turnover with the other Anglico team getting ready to leave, he's introducing me to all the people he's been working with. And it's like 15 different teams. Yep. You know, they're not running operations with like three battalions. It's 40 squads, you know, and these guys are going out in 12, 13 man teams and they all need you. Yep. So and there's operations. I mean, just so everyone knows, there's five thousand six hundred people <laughs> in the one one AD, or you showed up at the two two eight. So it's six thousand people or whatever. And there's operations going on all over Ramadi every single night. There's people patrolling. There's people getting in firefights every single night. Yeah. There's constant gunfire, and so there's no way with three teams you're going to cover all that. You can't do it. Yeah, it, and that was sort of the immediate awareness for me is not only was I not going to be able to support everything. I know how to prioritize and tell folks, hey, we can do this and not that. You know, I can help you here or, or there. And so very quickly, it was a matter of how am I going to break down my team and support these guys? Um, I did have an advantage that I was, as an F-18 pilot, that was the primary aircraft. F-18s and Harrows are the primary aircraft that was doing the support. And I knew those airplanes really well. And I was able to very quickly, when I saw what the Army, hey, we're doing this patrol today, and we're going to take our Humvees from the Camp Ramadi to go to this location. And it would be really difficult just to get there, just navigating at night in your Humvees on the night vision goggles, and the roads can be kind of confusing, and you know what it's like down there. And some days you're operating in downtown Ramadi, and it's straight up urban combat, like just buildings. And five miles away, you can be in a place, we called it Mike Charlie One, that it looks like Vietnam. I mean, Absolutely. it's it's it, it, the contrast if we're being so close together was so incredible how different those places were. And so every environment was different. I was able to understand how what airplanes could do well and not well in those environments. And so as they asked for support, I'm like, hey, I can't really do that. But what I can do is this. And maybe this will be more helpful for you. And I could very quickly build a relationship with the Army, which is really who you needed to be the best support for the Marines they were gonna get on board we were good we had a relationship I wasn't worried about my Marines and us building our team what I was worried about was us as a team being effective for the folks we were supporting and showing that we could do good work for those guys and we took a very different approach uh, I immediately broke our team into three separate teams six one six two and six three I actually sent the six three team a guy named Alan to another base, uh, Blue Diamond, you remember that mm -hmm. base right across the river? Because there was a company based out of Blue Diamond that were doing operations independently and they never had any Anglico support. So like, dude, you gotta go move, they literally moved there and lived with those guys. And then my other team, 6-1 and 6-2, Adam and I just, we took a whiteboard and all the requests for support, we just started plugging our names in. And so it was just, I had five guys, he had four, he had his own Humvee, I had my own Humvee, we had all the weapons, all the radios, and just started to just go do operations. 228 would do everything for just a little vehicle patrol where they would just do a presence patrol, there are two Humvees driving around the city, we would just jump in on that and just bring a third truck, which was a ton of firepower and awareness. Sometimes we were just doing foot patrols and we would just go walk around and do move into contact or do room clearing, stuff like that. Jocko man, I, I found myself way way out of my comfort zone very early. I think my second mission there was a raid where I was ended up like clearing a room. I was in a stack <laughs> of dudes clearing a room while I was trying to talk to airplanes overhead of where and 
it was a, just a basically a manpower shortage. Like, yeah, you get in, yeah. go, go, you and these two guys go clear the room. Oh, okay, Roger that. You know, um, and I was a senior or mid grade major. I was, a, I was always kind of one of the senior guys, but I wasn't in charge of this. So yeah. I'd be working for a first lieutenant, which was perfectly fine. It was his platoon. He was doing this mission. He knew what he was doing. I was there to support as best as I could. That image of like, yeah, just get up on the roof and control air. It'll be awesome. What do you need me to blow up? Negative. I mean, it was, hey, get in line and, and, and start getting after it. And I think that I remember that second mission. We're with the 228, and, and the lieutenant was, I think he was like a, I think he worked at Home Depot. Mm-hmm. No joke. Because there was a National Guard unit. Yeah, National Guard unit. These dudes were awesome. awesome They'd been guys. there for probably 10 or 11 months by the time I got there, maybe even longer. They'd been there almost a year. Hardened dudes that had lost a lot of guys and sacrificed a ton, but I was learning everything I could from them because they were veterans and I was brand new. I was supposed to bring this great capability, but the reality was I was just soaking up from them as much as I could. And... I'm I'm clearing a room with this guy, you know. I, I, <laughs> so, the phrase "What am I doing here?" Uh, went through my head a lot uh, while I was there, and it was just kind of. Ramadi was the type of place that the deal was is when you got there, it was just a bullet train, and and you just jumped on the train, you, or you had to. Yeah. You were you couldn't slow things down. You certainly couldn't ask those other guys, "Hey, can we can we dial it back a little bit? We need to get up to speed." They were just doing their thing, and if you're going to be anything other than a hindrance, you need to get on board immediately. And so that's what we did as best we could. Um, and I have a lot to thank for those guys at 228 because no matter how hard we tried, those first couple times, we're, we're just getting up to speed. We're, we're not uh, you know, bringing our A game yet. We're, we're trying to figure out what's going on around us, and there's no doubt that without those guys, their leadership, their willingness to kind of bring us on board and get us up to speed, that played a big part. We got up to speed quickly. But day one, I'm sure you know we were struggling to yeah, keep up. Yeah, it's just like we were talking about with flying and jujitsu totally. and fighting and everything else. You show up there and things are going. They're not slowed down a third. They're going five times faster, and you're just seeing. You know, you're getting told to clear a room. That's the only thing in the world you can see is now this room, and you're not aware of all this other stuff that's going on. And it definitely takes some ops to get your to get your senses about you of what's happening. Yeah. And the ops were, there were so many different kinds of operations. Like I said, you know, you'd go from doing just, um, you know, a, a three Humvee presence patrol in downtown Ramadi is not cool. <laughs> it's not. It's just, you're just waiting for something to go wrong. Yeah. You know, whether it's getting lit up, you know, in a firefight, RPGs getting shot. I mean, you're literally just driving around waiting for somebody to do something to you, you know, these presence patrols. And then you go right from that to, You'd get some intelligence that somebody you needed to grab was in, uh, you know, a house somewhere in a totally different environment, and you'd be off doing a raid. We helped stand up the QRF. You've talked about that in the past, the Quick Reaction Force, where you, you literally just waited right outside the gate of the main base for somebody to call for help. Okay, something's gone wrong. It's here. Come help us. And so we just started doing all these missions, and I, I just was on board with all of them and, and they varied and they were very different from day to day. And you got um, to call for fire too. Dude, Legit. We, we did. We we between me, I did a lot and and my teams, we I controlled the release of every single piece of ordnance in the Marine Corps inventory. Uh, uh, in Marine Corps inventory. So every piece of ordnance that the the air uh, the Hornets and the Harriers dropped and everything from the Hueys and the Cobras and artillery, we called artillery as well. They had a, you know, a, a uh, field artillery battalion out there that we did controls from as Anglico. I did myself. So, you know, that story, you know, when you get to TBS, there's an old saying in the Marine Corps, we all subscribe to it. Every Marine's a rifleman. And when you're a Top Gun instructor, that could not be further from the truth. <laughs> because the last thing you are as a Top Gun, as the training officer at Top Gun, skiing in Lake Tahoe on a Saturday afternoon, is a rifleman. But I will, I will say this uh, for the Marine Corps. Yeah, I'm biased. I'm a little parochial to the Marine Corps. Dude, it's all in there. The OCS, TBS, all that exposure, all that doctrine, everything you learn, it's there. Now, it took a while to dig down and find it. And those same things, that when I went to OCS and I was the skinniest guy there and I was scared I couldn't get through and I'm like, wait a second, bigger, tougher, stronger dudes are doing this or not doing this than I am. It's all in there. And so I just had to figure out how to tap that stuff again and bring it back up and just go do it. So great decision here i am in ramadi getting after it and then you guys showed up <laughs> yeah it, it, there was one story you were telling me that you were calling for fire up in mc1 and it was your buddy oh yeah yeah we are doing um 
we're doing what's called movement to contact, my favorite mission as a pilot. <laughs> Nothing better than movement to contact. And a movement to contact mission is you literally you drive your Humvees, take all your, your folks out, and you set up a staging area on the north side of this uh, this big area. is big, kind of wooded, dirt. It has like little ravines and trees and stuff like that. And we would just – we would walk a patrol. I mean, you know, 10, 15 guys would just go from north to south, and the mission was called movement to contact. So you walked until – you got in contact, which meant you got into a firefight. And I remember, not this same day, but my first day going there, I think it was Bravo Company, a 228. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was. And I met the platoon commander for the first time. And I kind of get out of my Humvee. I walk up. I'm, I'm looking for the platoon commander. I'm there as a supporting asset. I'm a, I'm a helpful guy because I bring airplanes. It's going to be good for them. And he walks up, and he's got a shotgun <laughs> hanging on his on his kit. And, you know, I was a brand-new guy, but, I, you know, I was, I'm like, hey, hey, what's with the shotgun? You know, I... I have a rifle. Everybody's got a rifle. He goes, hey, to be honest with you, I find that this is the best weapon for these type of missions. <laughs> and it turns out he actually was right on that patrol. It's like, dude, what am I doing here, man? This, you know, I'm going to go do a foot patrol with a guy with a shotgun. Yeah. Um, so I knew that I was in. there was a lot in store for that. Um, <laughs> and we would do these patrols, these, these move into contacts, and you'd end up in a building. And my job as a fact was, hey, get out in the building, get up on top of the roof right away. And I would do Overwatch, you know, similar, different assets. I had airplanes. I had radios. SEALs would do Overwatch all the time. And it was just a matter of cover and move. So I would get up on the roof and I'd go, hey, this is what I see. This is what the airplane sees. Okay, you guys jump to that next building. Sometimes the next building would be 20 yards away. Sometimes it would be 200 yards away. So you would, you would just do these bounding movements building to building. And then when they get to the next building, my other guy would be up on the roof. He'd say, you're good. And we'd run down and go to the next building. Um, and so... We get into this building, and as soon as I get up on top of the roof of the building, so if you can picture it, half of us are in the roof of the building, half of the other guys are trying to move to the other building, so they're out in the open. And from that other building, as I get up on the roof, I look up, and the first thing that happens is like three RPGs hit the building that I'm in directly underneath me. Probably, probably miss our team by like 15 feet below us, so above their heads and below us. That's the first thing that happens. And there was a vehicle, like a truck, and nah, I was a car, it was like uh, just some car in between on a like, kind of a dirt road behind some trees where this fire came from. And we had airplanes overhead. It was two F 18Ds, I remember it, um, from a, a, an East Coast uh, squadron. And, um, you know, at TBS, they teach you, hey, every Marine's a rifleman, and they tell, they tell you these stories is that one day you're going to be in a position where. You're going to be in a firefight, and there's going to be an airplane overhead, and it's going to be a buddy of yours from TBS. It's going to be your old buddy, and you're going to be like, hey, Jocko, it's Dave. Help me out. And Dave's going to roll in on his white horse and come in with his hornet and blast these things out, of, and, and your infantry buddy is going to thank you one day. I'm like, right on. <laughs> the only problem was that I was on the ground, and the guy flying the airplane was one of my closest friends, a guy named uh, Boo Friedman, who was an opso of the squadron. I just left, and no joke, I'm like, Hey, we're in, a, we're in a troops in contact. You know, we're taking fire from wherever. And on the radio, he says, "Hey, Chip, it's Boo. What do you need?" <laughs> and it took me right back to TBS. Only the problem was I was supposed to be in an airplane when that happened. And I'm like, I said, uh, I said, um, south to north, call wings level. And 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 that's what happened. And and I had four passes from these F-18s. Did these strafing runs on this car. And I remember looking at the uh, the army guys with us and the first lieutenant. And I looked at him. I go. Dude, we're gonna be fine. That's like awesome. super cool, like very chill. Hey, this just happened. I see what's going on. This Hornets overhead had, had saw everything. What do you need? I need this. We're in. And you know, the next call was wings level. Hey, you're cleared hot. And you know, the hair and arm standing up telling the story. It's just one of those stories where the Marine Corps, for whatever insane reason, will take F-18 pilots and train them millions of dollars and ten years of, of training them, and they'll stick them on the ground. And it's for that exact reason that that exact event was i could bring an asset that the army would never have in an environment that they would never be able to use and through two buddies just talking plain english to each other on the radio make it happen in like that and um i was supposed to be in that airplane jocko that's how it was supposed <laughs> to work out but in that particular day man it was the roles were reversed but it was it was an awesome it was kind of a culmination of a lot of things like that the marine corps it's a legit that thing they breed in us, it's a real thing. Uh, and it was pretty satisfying, to be honest with you. You see that car burn in the ground. And then uh, eventually, yeah, I don't know, maybe a month or so goes by, and we show up. And who's the first, who's, who'd you meet first, Leif? Yep. 
Leif uh, was the first guy that I met. Um, actually, Leif and Tony All right. show up together. Um, so we had seen you guys. You know, I, you, we had turned over, and we were just kind of getting up to speed. We'd probably been there maybe a month or so before you guys had. So, you know, quick learning curve. We're just kind of getting comfortable uh, with what's going on. We also know there's a new brigade platoon coming in. I'm sorry, uh, a new um, uh, uh armored division coming in we know that the unit that were there the 228 that brigade combat team is leaving we new new brigade combat team is coming in and we were actually in just a relatively short period of time we we're kind of the continuity because all the old guys are leaving we ha- we had the overlap right. so we had a kind of a prominent role with the new battalion and the new battalion commander he's retired now um awesome dude from uh 137 armor guy named tedesco just an awesome, awesome dude just an awesome dude <laughs> awesome um he w- had been there as part of his turnover it had come out a couple of months prior maybe a month prior and saw us and we had my to favorite thing about tedesco is like you said awesome guy we we were getting ready to do a big operation with them i think it was the first time we were pushing into south central ramadi and, and we were in his briefing and he's quoting pat <laughs> But he's quoting Pat in the movie. <laughs> he's just getting <laughs> after it. I was like, yes, yeah. yes, thank you. Thank you for bringing me here this day. Yeah, he was awesome. And he had seen me. It just so happened when he was doing his initial turnover f- before the, ba- the the battalion came out, I had done. I had controlled uh, uh, um, a release. I controlled a Hellfire and blew up a car. Uh, and he got to see it. And it was kind of a cool thing as he comes and he's like, who, you know, who are these guys? Right. Uh, I'm in the middle of doing a, a real control. I happen to be in the COC that day. Pull up a car. It's all in the video. We got this big TV screens that show the whole thing. And this car detonates and cool pictures and everything. And he he comes over to me after we're done. I'm kind of sitting there. And he's a lieutenant colonel. I'm a major. And I'm like, hey, sir. He's like, can you do that when we get here? I'm like, absolutely, man. He's like, we're going to get along great. That was my initial re- inter- interaction with him. So it was awesome. And so we knew when they were coming back, we had already just through virtue of that experience built some pretty good inroads of them and we we're going to do some good work. He was also the type of guy, look, there's this whole brigade combat team came in, that's 5,000 guys, but his battalion, that group of, you know, several hundred was really the core group that I initially did most of my work with. And his approach was, if you can help us, you're on the team. Yep. Their um, same exact attitude he had with us. Yeah, for sure. For all the enablers, so uh, they were called the bandits, and they yeah. had a little bandit pin, uh, had kind of a skull and crossbones kind of thing. You were, if you, you were, a, I was a bandit to for him, sure. just totally on board the team, and he treated us like his own guys, and that was awesome. And so, um, all the enablers, we had military, we had working dogs, we had explosive ordnance disposal, we had the Anglico folks, we had the SEALs, you know, all these different groups from different places that none of them were assigned to him, but his approach was, if you can help my soldiers out, you're a, you're a bandit, you're on the team, and everybody was like, right on, let's do this, because that's, you needed to work with them anyway, you might as well make the best of it. We started to do a couple of missions, and every one of those missions was your teams and my teams, uh, and I would say probably in the first week or so, you know, I'm guessing a little bit of dates but relatively quick in the first couple of missions we are doing the similar things we're bringing support and overwatch and helping these guys do their job which is the exact same thing you guys were doing you know totally different ways but right. ultimately we're supporting these guys i'm in my my little building there or one day whatever just sitting around prepping for something and in walks leif and tony <laughs> you know he drove they drove over from your base which is kind of you know a little bit of a haul around mm-hmm. around there drive in and he goes hey man um Love to work with you more. We find a way that we can work together on some of these missions. And we got this big mission coming up. You want to come down and and brief with us? Well, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to go brief with the SEALs and it'd be awesome. I thought it would just be the kind of this cool one-time thing I get to see how SEALs do business. Um, and that was it. That was his introduction. Had Leif and Tony, I, I'll be really candid. I, I'd like to think I would have done that. I doubt I would have gone to Shark Base and knocked on your door and said, hey, Leif, Jocko, let's do some work together. I, he made that initial contact and him and we, Tony we were definitely equal opportunity employers <laughs> at that time, point man, man. If we, we the same thing as you know Colonel Tedesco if we thought someone could do something to help us out or we could complement each other in any way man we were knocking on doors to to try and make that happen for sure yeah and, and that was his approach um, I didn't I'd never done any work on the ground I didn't know much about the seals I'll be very blunt I had my own op- opinion of what I assumed you guys would be like and it was probably something out of the movies. I expected like long beards and dudes just running around doing their own thing. Uh, and so I was actually a little surprised that that Leif came and asked to do some work with us. And so I, I went to that first night mission, uh, that first brief. I, I don't want to say I was skeptical, but I was certainly interested in what 
because my fear was that you guys are going to go do your own thing and my guys are kind of just either not be able to keep up, not know what you're doing and not fit in very well and be able to help out and just kind of put ourselves at risk. And, and look, I'll, I'll say this very bluntly. I have a very high bar when you leave Top Gun on what to expect from a mission brief and mission execution and mission debrief because that's what we're all about. And I was pretty sure that there's no chance that you were going to do anything anywhere near that. And I was shocked and kind of overwhelmed at how professional your organi- your your team was. And that was the biggest thing for me was what are these guys going to be like? I just sort of pictured a kind of a pickup game. Hey, let's go out there and just, you know, kill some bad guys and come on back and high five each other. And dude, it was one of the most professional organized mission briefs. I totally understood what your plan was. I knew exactly where I was going to fit in. We went and did it. And then you guys debriefed after we came back after this. It was a relative unevent. Nothing really happened that night in terms of in the grand scheme of things that we saw we were there. And then you debriefed it. You guys came back and you mission debriefed. Dudes were there kind of cleaning weapons and and going through and analyzing what happened. And that was it, man. I was totally on board. I was, I was, I was sold at that we could work together like pretty effectively. Um, and that was kind of the beginning. It just sort of started out of the blue and you guys came down and asked to do some good work and, and we did. Man, you did a lot of work. I did. <laughs> Your team did a lot of work with us. Cause yeah. we, we started to think, cause, cause for our, from our perspective, and I know that, you know, there's one uh, junior officer out there who's now probably a lieutenant commander or maybe even a commander at this yeah. point. But at that time, you know, he was on his first deployment and he was a JTAC. What we call in the SEAL teams, our air controllers are called a JTAC. And so here he is in some of those missions, instead of being a SEAL, he's being a JTAC. So he's one of those guys that looked over at you guys and said, hey, wait a second, can you take this radio from me and do that thing so I can go do my Frogman stuff over here? And that, ad- and plus, again, to be blunt, you guys could do it a lot better than we could, period. You know, we, we, you, know you were an F-18 pilot, for crying out loud, and we had a new guy, junior officer, on the radio trying to call for fire. You guys were just I- imminently better qualified to do it. And so, yeah, we looked at it as if, okay, we, that gives us one more shooter, and it gives us a whole new level of expertise. Now, of course, there's JTACs and the SEAL teams that they are a lot more experienced, and they're awesome, and of course. But in our group, to bring you guys was just a huge level up for us to get a lot better and give us more people to maneuver as SEALs on assaults or on overwatches or whatever. So it turned out to be a, a real good little little relationship yeah. we got going there it was a classic win-win <laughs> yeah. when a when a seal says hey would you control the air so i can go shoot people <laughs> you know and that means i'm no i don't have to clear that room and be in a position where i might have to do something like that <laughs> i'm all over it and i yeah i know who you're talking about we had a he and i had a great relationship someone that i really loved working with who wanted to go be a frogman like you said i wanted to go control airplanes <laughs> and uh we found a way to make that stuff work now it, it was, it was a big deal for me though, man. To, to for my for me and my guys to work with you guys because uh, you've said this on the podcast, um, and, and I know, I know how organizations can. We're not necessarily parochial that we don't trust other people, but we get really comfortable with how we do business. And to just bring in another group of dudes, I think this also speaks volumes to Tedesco and all those guys. You're gonna just you want to make sure those guys can keep up, you know. And everybody knows that. You guys are legit, man. And to keep up, you got, you're going to have to keep up. You're going to have to carry your own weight, and you're going to have to make it happen. You're going to have to provide something. Because the minute you become a drain on the on the team, you know, you're know you going to get cut loose. And we, we couldn't afford to be a drain on you, and we couldn't afford to have other people be a drain on us. So I think there was a lot of kind of at the beginning of – there were a lot of reasons why it wouldn't have worked. There's a whole bunch of reasons why it wouldn't have worked. And the only reason it did work is that everybody was committed to building a relationship to support – the battalion. That was it. Yeah. We all had the same end state in mind. It wasn't about what can the SEALs do to be SEALs and be great. Or how, it was what can we do to support those guys? Yeah, well, it's the whole thing I was opening up with. That's sort of where that came from. It's just this attitude that everybody there was on the same team. Yeah. <laughs> Straight up on the same team. And so then that turned into big missions, you know, big missions pushing into Ramadi, putting in the combat outposts, you know, uh, night after night, day after day, doing those those big operations. And that relationship just got, just got stronger and stronger. You know, uh, Leif obviously with you, and and just turned into something really, not just not just cool, but man, effective. Yeah, 
effective. Yeah. It was. I mean, in that deployment, I've, I, I kept a long journal. I, I took a lot of notes on my experience there. And I've gone back and reread it a few times. And I've somewhat recently, throughout that whole thing, one of the common themes is how there'll be Leif and I did this today. Or our t- we did stuff with you all the time. And it kind of became in that middle, that kind of June, July, August. I, I mean, that was all we were really doing because yeah. we were so busy. And there, the big op was kicking off, and we were starting to get into downtown. But you know, places we'd never been. All these clearings, and all that stuff, and so the need for us to support the army, and the need for you to support the army again, we could have had ten times as many folks, and we probably still could have done more work. Um, everything in that journal is just about what we were doing together. And I think at the time, I just kind of lost track of it because we were just every day get up and go do something. I mean, there was no down days. There was hardly ever any time we weren't doing anything. And it was almost always with you guys. Um, and it was a huge highlight for me uh, to, to, to be with a group of guys that were so on board with just making things happen. You guys had an incredible knack of this is in the way or this process keeps it. Yeah, we got that sorted out. Whoa. Hey, I need to get airplanes. Uh, that, well, you had to do this and this. You got no, no, no. We, got, we can get this sorted out. And so... <laughs> You guys had uh, kind of had cornered the market on what do you need? We'll make we'll get it. We'll make it happen. And for me um, to be able to get that asset sort of delivered that I could and hey, you did all the work to get it, but I can control the hell out of it. Right on, man. I didn't have to do any of the work to explain why I needed this because you guys did all that work and you had a valid reason for it. They would laughed at me if I said I wanted an AC 130 gunship. I'm like, who are you? <laughs> I'm Dave Burke, man. I'm like negative. <laughs> Leif and Jocko need an AC 130 gunship. <laughs> Not every time, you know, obviously it was a thin asset, but when that thing showed up overhead and then you get the guy we we're talking about, I was like, you want to control this? I'm like, yes, I do. I want to control this thing. So there's a lot of mutual benefit there. And I think what we also proved is I think for the battalion and the brigade, they figured out that we were really helpful in helping those guys accomplish what they wanted to accomplish. And that was just, I'm not putting very good words to it right now, but it was obviously real rewarding. And it was a highlight of that deployment is our ability to work together. Through, like I said, there's a whole laundry list of reasons why we shouldn't have been able to do this. A bunch. You didn't work for me. I didn't outrank you. Your guy. There's just a whole bunch of institutional roadblocks that we could have just stayed in our own corners, in our own thing, and you and I could have never met. And that wouldn't have really been all that uncommon. Mm-hmm. It would have just been ops normal. Um, it worked out, man. Yeah. A lot of awesome highlights on that deployment, and obviously some of the worst days of our lives were over there. June 20th. Talk to me about that. Yeah, man. Um, so obviously I know we're going to talk about this. Um, so we had been there quite a bit, and I remember kind of the shock when we first got there talking to the 228. I, first day I'm there, I go to Alpha Company, and they've got a memorial outside of their uh, compound of all the soldiers that have been killed. I can picture it. It's just kind of like a... Names are on a little placard, and it's kind of a tall little pyramid-looking thing with the names on there. And you see it. You understand it. Hey, people have died here. You get it. It's not hard to, to understand that those things have happened, but there's just a level of disconnect when you first get there. You're like, oh, people are dying, but you, don't, you, you haven't seen it. And then you know, very quickly, I think probably my second mission out there was uh, kind of a QRF from a, a vehicle IED, so basically an uh, um an insurgent with a bunch of bombs in his vehicles got in between American convoy and blew himself up. So I see my first dead body. You know, I see oh, this real combat. People are dying here. It was an enemy. It wasn't the same. And then, you know, March, April, May, we started taking, I mean, not started, we continued to take casualties and I'm starting to go to memorials and we're starting to see guys that we knew and worked with and we're friends with and built relationships with and they're, they're, they're getting killed or really gravely wounded. And those memorials started to become every couple of days we're going to a memorial. And that sort of weighs on you. I've thought about this a lot and how it affected me you know, as a pilot being out of my comfort zone in this environment and, and what that was like. But without trying to diminish any of that loss, there's a there's a disconnect when it's not your person when it's not your guy and on june 20th so chris leon who was my radio operator we were in a building that we had been in let me back up i was not there 
I had left that building that morning, gone back to the COC. Adam's team with Chris had replaced us. And we were basically just going back and forth operations into this, this combat outpost because it gave us a really good view of the north part of the city. And we had to be there, basically 24-7. And, and Chris and, and Adam's team had gone back out there, and they were supposed to go from like 12 to 4 or something like that. I don't know what it was. We gave them like a six-hour shift or something. And then we were going to kind of figure out if we replace or start over. We had just sort of sent them out there, and we're going to come back in a little bit. And I got a call on the radio from the battalion saying, hey, can you extend your Anglico team out here for four hours? We're going to go do another movement to do some clearing. I'm like, yeah, roger that. Hey, Adam, can you guys stay out for another couple hours? You know, support, we're going to get you here or whatnot. You know, standard answer, yeah, roger that, no problem. And then during that time, um, it was not uncommon to take fire in, from that, in that OP, and there was some sniper fire. And the first shot, uh, there was a younger Marine, Lance Corporal, who was up there, and Chris ran up from the other side and kind of put put him down. You know, say, "Hey, why don't you get down, take cover, go go over to the other side of the building?" And Chris got up to start to. He was a uh, he was doing his observation to try to figure out what's going on, and, and Chris was shot by a sniper. And I get a call, kind of very very closely after that, from Adam. You know, I'm, I'm kind of manning the radios all the time anyway, and even in our home little base there, like where we had a radio right there. So I, I was never really not there. I was just on the radio and said, hey, Corporal Leon's been hit. We're on our way back. And that was about it. So I didn't have any real good sense of anything that was going on. And um, a little panic sets in, like, okay. Um, and I don't want to press for too much information. I get a call from Alpha Company who had, who manned all the observation posts between where he was and where we were that they were clearing, make sure the roads were clear. They're using their tanks and their Bradleys so they could pick them up and bring a straight shot because that was a pretty busy, dangerous road. He always had to look out for IEDs and stuff like that. And so everybody's kind of picking up the pace to clear out that road and he's coming back. And I get a call. Hey, he's breathing. Uh, we're heading straight to Charlie Med. And I'm like, all right, okay. I kind of had this sense of this is going to be okay. Um, Charlie Med is this medical facility on the, the camp that we were stationed at there and it was literally 100 yards from where I slept and I just ran down to Charlie Med uh, to meet the Humvee I was there and I, I'm sorry it wasn't a Humvee it was a Bradley Bradley fighting vehicle Bradley pulls up myself and my, my corpsman doc are there the, the, the Bradley has a door on the back of the Bradley that comes down like a ramp uh, and the ramp comes down he's on a stretcher Doc goes up to get the front piece of the stretcher. I'm at the bottom, and he comes down carrying the stretcher, and Chris is laying on the stretcher. And I, he, he went right by me. I looked at him, and I knew immediately that he was gone. Was, I mean, he was gone. It was, I could see the entrance wound. The whole thing was all kind of there. They had stabilized him. They had done their best to kind of manage the wood. But there was no question that the outcome had already played itself out, and <clears throat> Chris was gone. They take him in to the medical facility, um, which I'd been in and you've been in a, a dozen times for a whole host of different reasons, but it always been somebody else. I mean, I may have known that person and been close to that person, but it was always somebody else. And Doc goes in with him. He's carrying the stretcher and he comes out and probably, Doc goes probably 10 seconds and he just comes out with his head shaking. And I knew I, I wasn't holding my breath or hold, I, I knew, but he kind of came out and, and just sort of. I guess confirmed if that's the word I'm looking for just sort of it made it official that that Chris had been killed and um, it, it sort of initiated just a very strange kind of very sequence of events so I I knew Adam and the rest of the team are trying to get back and they're gonna have a slower road back because they're not gonna get the support it's just gonna take a little more time they're gonna get their gear and all the things go along with that Chris just got loaded in Humvee and, and racing back in a Bradley they're kind of loading up their Humvees, and it's just going to take some time. And I'm like, hey, I need to get back to the vehicle. We parked our trucks because I want to meet them there. And I walk back, like I said, it was maybe 100 yards from my hooch to, to Charlie Med, and I get about halfway there. And I had this thought that, that I maybe didn't confirm that Chris was killed. And so I actually walked all the way back to go find – there's a senior medical officer. We called him the SMO, really awesome guy that dealt with all the, the casualties there, who I knew, because I'd done control, I had controlled helicopter Casavacs on wounded folks. I'd been there a lot, we did, we gave blood. I mean, we were in that facility all the time. And I f 
I don't know why I needed to do it, but I was, I, I, I'm like, I just, I had to talk to him that, Hey, is, is, is Corporal Leon, is, is he, is he killed? And he's like, yeah, I'm sorry, man. You know, it, it was kind of an odd conversation. I, th- I could tell the why he was looking at me like, why are you asking me this question? Like, it just was one of those things that I was in sort of, I think it's just a stage of disbelief that as I walked back and I was going to deliver the news, I had sort of told myself like, I can't tell them in case, what if I'm wrong? Cause I never really went through that. I saw him, I saw doc, I, but there were no words were exchanged. And I had this very odd, like walking back and forth a couple of times and kind of sorting it out. And then, you know, my job was next thing I had to do is I, Adam, I watched the trucks pull up. They all get out you know, four guys and everybody else had heard, you know, all the Anglico teams that were there and we shared a facility with EOD and the working dogs. Everybody, you know, the word was passed that something had happened. And I, you know, hey, Corporal Leon's, Corporal Leon's dead. Um, you know, we do something called, I think it's called a hero flight. Mm-hmm. Uh, hero flight's gonna be at like 1600. I, I got the information in like 10 minutes. The, the process of them bringing in a casualty, that casualty not surviving, and then moving, they had that thing wired. Um, and I'd seen it done a bunch of times, but it just, it was Chris, it was my guy, it was a guy that I just knew differently than everybody else, and I just saw him differently. When we entered our trucks, he was the back left, and I was the front right, and our trucks were always parked, backed into their spots, so they're always side by side. So the back left of his truck enter door, and the right front of my truck door, we always had a fight space for each other, <laughs> you know? Chris was a standard perfect Marine. Like he could be 90% of the way through. If he saw me walking up, he'd get out of the way, close the door, let me in. I'm like, ah, oh, come on, dude. Like just, he was just a great Marine. Just, I walked past that kid without even really talking to him, you know, a thousand times, just every single day, a couple of times a day. And, um, it, it demystifies as a, as a Marine, you just live a slightly bit for me, and I shouldn't say you, how it felt for me as I just felt with all that was going on and all the destruction and the death and the violence and all the things that I'd sort of become accustomed to at that point, there's just an aspect of it that's just a tiny bit insulated in your life to a really small degree, but it's enough to just keep you sort of preserved. And when Chris was killed, it just sort of exposed that. It broke down one of my last little boundary of I'm, I'm, I'm okay here cause I can do this because I'm going to get through this. I'm going to go home and everything's going to be okay. Um, and that hurt a lot that hurt in ways that I did not understand how it was going to hurt. I just didn't, I, I just didn't know what that was going to be like. And the, 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 all those next steps, and you, I know you know this because you, you saw it. He's on a helicopter and he's gone flying away in that 46 in what feels like about a minute. It's hours and hours. You even rehearse the, the movement onto the, the, to carry him onto the hel- But you go from Chris's city's on his way into watching the helicopter fly away and it feels like it takes about that long. And then you're just sort of left and you walk back. You, you literally walk away from the medical facility where the helicopter just takes off and you walk back a hundred yards and you just go back to your room. Only Chris is gone. And it's like that whole deployment kind of, re, I don't know what the right word is. It's like I had to start the deployment again because all the things that I was dealing with and all the things that I was managing and leading as, as the leader, you know, whatever you want to say was my job, it all just sort of changed in terms of what I thought really w- The guys that I was working with, everything was different now because it was their brother that was gone, not somebody else. And it just sort of changed the calculus and it really redefined the rest of that deployment. And I'll be really, really blunt. It was hard for me to not fold. And there was a lot of instinct of like, I do not want to do this anymore. I do not want to be here. This is more than I had bargained for. And this, we can laugh about volunteering and being a Marine, you know, it was a little more than I bargained for. And look, man, we had done some crazy stuff at that point and I'd seen some bad things happen. I was a participant in some bad things and I was okay. I was doing okay. And I was going to be okay with that. And this one just sort of, I just, it, I struggled with it a little bit. So it was a tough day, man. Yeah. And obviously 
you know for for us it was you know what a month and a half later on August 2nd when when Mark got killed and you know I, I think that's one of the things that that we felt you know that little bit of insulation that you're talking about we felt it we felt I will say I would say actually more insulated because you know my guys were out there taking massive risks getting in crazy gunfights getting after it to a degree that no one had ever thought they would and we were doing all right we had a couple guys get wounded here and there but they were okay and and honestly that guys getting wounded you know if it's not a, a, a devastating wound I mean I had you know one of my guys got wounded early on and he, he almost lost his leg but guess what he didn't and that that didn't make us feel more vulnerable in my mind it made us feel stronger and like hey we might get wounded but we're, we're gonna be good and so yeah when mark got killed and, and especially mark who was you know such a gregarious and such a guy so full of life that you don't think he can be killed you don't think he can be killed and same thing you know that insulation was just completely shattered and I think what was also it was it was recognizable it was recognizable to me was that other people outside of task unit bruiser they thought the same thing they thought hey the seals are here they're gonna they're they're gonna they're gonna push through this they're gonna they're gonna win and there nothing's gonna happen to them and we saw it, you know, at the memorial service. You could see in guys' faces that they were, they were also, their insulation about us was was kind of shattered too. And, and then it turns into, damn, if the seals can get killed, wh- where am I at? And I think that was another thing that that really, you know, that was another thing that really just made Mark getting killed such a such an impact to all of us. There, dude, there's no doubt that what you just said is exactly how it played out. You were the first guy to talk to me when when Chris's helicopter flies away. It's it's literally dusty and the, you know the helicopter's loud and it kicks up dust there and it's, it was dark. It was nighttime, and you came up to me, and I don't remember the exact words, but we were just turning around and walking back, and you said something like, "We're gonna get after this, guys, and we're gonna go find the snipers that are doing this." Something to those words, and it was basically like. We're gonna take care of this, and I remember feeling really comforted by that. Like, yeah, man, yeah, go do that. That's awesome, and feeling good about that. That we weren't helpless, and we're just gonna suck it up and deal with this just this terrible loss. That we're we're gonna get something from this. We're gonna go find some guys and go get after it. And we're gonna go kill these guys. Yes, and you guys and you guys were gonna you guys were gonna make that happen. And I I remember feeling. I remember how that felt and look June 20th August 2nd just like everything else was a blur man it was like it was like the it might as well just been the next day because things happened so fast there and I was you know I wasn't on the patrol uh, on this on August 2nd but I was on the radio I was a guy running the air I was doing all the same stuff we always did you know and I was back in the COC with you uh, working that mission all that stuff that happened and before you know it we're watching the helicopter fly away um, you know, or, or, or he's gone, you know, and you're, and you're seeing the, 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 the aftermath of that. And I actually went back last night to look at my journal entry for that day because I ended up running down to Charlie Met again. Cause that's where everybody came in. And I remember seeing Leif there, you know, Leif was a guy I worked with a ton and there he is. He's got a wound. I'm looking at it. I'm over, I'm standing over his right shoulder. They're cutting his shirt off. They're, 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 they're attending to Leif who was, Leif was a larger than life. You know, for a guy like me who always kind of felt a little bit like, what the hell am I doing here, man? What the hell am I doing with the SEALs? Like, this is insane. These guys are just, they're just larger than life. And to see the exposure of, of, of that, it, it, it bothered me. And I knew I had that feeling of, holy cow, if this can happen to these guys, you know, it can happen to any of us. And it's not a good feeling. And when you saw the guys from the team who were, it was just, it was just, everybody was scrambling and it was just that sense of, and I don't want to make it sound like there wasn't a nobody was panicking or freaking out. It was not like that, but it was just a tiny bit chaotic, if that makes sense, it, it, on a, a small degree, but enough when you were so used to just being completely not like that. That feeling, like like when Chris lost, was what I felt was like, 
oh man, I'm not really in control of any of this. I am not in control. All that stuff that I've told myself, all that comfort and confidence and we're getting better and I'm going to be more effective and do more good work until this thing is over. It was like, no, negative. That could be you. That could happen today. And then it, and between Chris and Mark, the army suffered a whole, oh, God bless. We were going to memorials like every couple of days. People were getting killed all the time. And every one of those eroded that, that confidence a little bit. And then when it happened to, to Mark and Leif, that was hard to see that. Um, and it, that was the feeling that I had. It was like, I'm, yeah. Maybe I'm just lucky, you know? Maybe, I, and maybe this whole thing is just luck. Um, now look, we, we regrouped, I mean, June 20th was a bad day. You know, we did all the things, we did the memorial, we paid our, our, we honored him the right way. You guys came and we did it the right way and we acknowledged, uh, Chris. Um, but if you kind of think of what's going on in Ramadi in the middle of June, man, there was no taking a knee. There was no like, let's hold off for a second, catch our breath. The bullet chain was just running. As a matter of fact, it was just gonna. It was actually just gonna get a ton worse. Yeah. You remember July and August were just, they were insane. They were insane. So we we lost Chris really at the big ramp up. Right. You know we had done a big movement in earlier in June and we were really starting to lay into the city. But the real, you know, the crazy J block, you know, that kind of stuff. All, that stuff was all out in front of us. Um, and so for me, it was you know my entire career. I've done a whole bunch of really great stuff in my career. Nothing is even. Nothing is even. It's not even worth talking about what anything else in my career has meant compared to that deployment and then that day. I mean, it's just light years different. Um, And it was like, you got to get up and go do it the very next day. And I remember going that first patrol, that first mission, and trying to get that feeling of, okay, yeah, it's different. And you got, I think you've got one of two ways to go with that. It's either going to get inside your head and kind of mess with you and break you a little bit, and, and I could feel that happening, or you just... You just, you just don't. You just shut it down and just go do it. Um, and I found how to compartmentalize. You know, I'd come back. I'd have moments when I was back on my hooch up on the roof by myself. I have my moments, man. No, I don't want anybody to think that I didn't. Uh, I had plenty of those moments. As a matter of fact, I, I still do, to be honest with you. I still have my moments. I go visit Chris at Arlington on his birthday. I go visit Chris on the day he was killed. I go to go visit Chris on Memorial Day. His mom comes out. I see Kat. She is, and I are very close. Um, I have my moments without a doubt. Um, but the rest of the three months in Ramadi, there was just not, there wasn't a ton of time to do that. So I guess I kind of just saved it maybe uh, for, for when I came back. And it it was there. I mean, it, it's not good. But um, yeah, man. <laughs>